Hello everyone and welcome on this live safari. Slightly delayed, apologies for that. But you haven't missed anything. So that's the good news. And Tebs, who's on camera with me this morning and I have been waiting patiently here with a few sleepy animals, one of which is the hyena you're looking at now. It's waiting patiently, very cleverly nearby. And what it's waiting for is the chance that there may be some spillage from a leopard kill which is hoisted up in this tree. It's not very easy to see, but there are some remains up in one of the forks of this tree, there we go, of an impala kill. And there's probably enough left there to keep Karula, a female leopard who's been feeding on this kill since she made it on Sunday night. And that, on the right hand side of the fork there, there's a bit of the impala's head. And on the left of the fork, a bit of the back remains. About 10% of the carcass. But again, not too easy for you guys to see. Certainly enough food to keep Karula in this area and also to warrant that hyena waiting here. Now, I'll show you the full picture. So over to our right over there somewhere is where the hyena is. And then over up in the tree here is the kill. And then down to our left is where Karula, this female leopard is. And she's fast asleep and can't blame her really. She's been gorging herself on the Impala for like I say, three full nights, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, apologies, four nights. So a long time. And I guess they only feed for kind of short periods. They're not going to feed permanently on any kill. So timing is everything. Yesterday evening we were lucky enough to get quite a lot of action. Some other hyena were on the scene. She had to hoist an impala fetus, which she had pulled out of the adult impala that's up in the tree behind us. She had hoisted that up into an apple leaf tree because hyenas had moved into the area and given her a bit of a hard time and chased her up there. So that was a great sighting that we had. Our timing was perfect just about. But now we are going to have to be patient. It's a uh, Beautiful cool day though, so it's not going to be difficult to sit around. Lots of cloud cover. I'm going to ask Tibbs just to pan out to the east. There's a pretty scene unfolding there. The sun's doing its best to try and punch through these cloudy conditions, but I don't think it's going to succeed any time soon. And even on the way into work this morning. There was a little bit of drizzle on the short drive basically along the edge of these clearings is where some of us stand. The rest of the camp are probably about three quarters of a mile away. So it was drizzling earlier. Let's hope the rain stays at bay. Another thing that will be happening later on is that Jamie will be conducting a drive from 8 a.m. until 9.30 a.m. So there will be an hour and a half of extra viewing. She will be catering entirely towards some schools that will be watching, so it's a slightly younger generation, but a lot of you I'm sure will be happy to join in on the adventure with her, so that's something exciting that a lot of you will probably be happy to hear about. Now, there are a few tiny pieces of meat at the base of this tree, sorry Tibbs, that we'll be able to show you. They are ever so small, but you can see a few little Nuggets of red there, some shards of bone, and it looks like a millipede might be actually snacking on a small portion of the, the meat, maybe getting some moisture from it. There are decomposers, millipedes, and I'm not sure if you can see it there on the right hand side, kind of top right out of all those little <coughs> red chunks of meat and bone. And that is what the hyena is going to come and snoop around for. I'm surprised it didn't or hasn't found it already. Not too sure why. It's just those tiny little morsels that they will be interested in. And I don't recognize this hyena. I'm not sure 
if we have seen it here before. The other hyena that was here yesterday evening seems to look different to that. For those of you who were watching, maybe you'll remember. And they're not animals we get to spend too much time with, so let's go and get a closer look of this hyena for you. Brent is also out with us this morning in another vehicle and he's searching desperately for any sign of the Salala Pride around the north western corner of Juma. There was word of them being around in the general area just to the west of our property. So now that we're a bit closer, maybe some of you will be able to remember whether this one was in fact the one from last night. But to me it looks like a slightly younger individual in better condition. And we've already got our first comment through. This one's from Edward. Good to have you on safari with us. And Edward has picked up on this hyena hanging around for three day old impala carcass and mentioned that he's certainly not envious of that situation and I guess you're right Edward but in the same breath three days of maturing in the tree may make for a slightly more tender impala than a fresh one I'm not too sure what the animals actually prefer but it will be easier to feed on and consume a slightly more well-aged piece of meat. Look at how nervous it gets when the wind picks up. You can see all those little bushes around it blowing in the wind. And even one of the apex predators of this area, the hyena, will still be cautious around a kill. It knows that there's a chance that lion could be in the area, that they could catch wind of this kill. So great that we got to see it kind of looking about like that, just making sure it's not complacent. It looks very, very comfortable using its little paws there as a pillow. What I always think about is how many interactions and how much time do these animals spend within close proximity to one another. Does Karula, this female leopard, know the eggs, this hyena personally? Does it remember how many kills this hyena is stolen from it? I've got a feeling that they do. Because just like the leopard, the hyena are also territorial. And territorial animals such as these, who will interact a lot with one another, naturally should get to know one another as individuals. I do think it's possible. I'm not sure what you guys think. Hello to Miss June in Dallas, Texas, and always good to hear you're on board with us. Miss June's one of our more regular viewers, for those of you who may be new to the safari, and it's very easy to send through questions like Miss June has just done. You can quest hashtag safari live rather on Twitter, or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Anyway, Miss June's interested to know which is the most patient of the cats when it comes to hunting. Not an easy one to answer, Miss Jen. I guess it'll depend a lot on the individual, but I would put lions, leopards, and cheetah, all the big cats, into kind of quite a similar bracket when it, when it comes to hunting. But maybe leopard will be, in general, the most patient because they do rely on their stealth more so than lion, who can rely on stealth combined with numbers. They've got 
So the, the numbers always aiding them, whereas uh, animals like leopards, which are solitary, don't have that extra help. So possibly that, also the fact that cheats are the fastest mammal on the planet, that's a huge advantage that they have over the leopard. And that's why maybe I'd lean towards the leopard being the most patient, because they need to be the most stealthy, lie in wait, be very, very close to their prey before they explode and try and bring them down. So I'd probably say the leopard, but a lot will depend on the individual. You'll get some leopards which are impatient hunters and therefore not very successful hunters. I think patience is a critical, critical uh, component and an important one when being a good hunter. So probably the leopard and other animals like hyena and wild dog, they'll be the least patient of them all because they are not stealth hunters. They are stamina hunters and they can run huge distances before they bring down their prey. A little group of water. And um, group of water would like to know if this hyena is a male. It looks like it could be, again just judging from its size. Males are slightly smaller than the females, but cannot be certain. This is a youngster, still in good condition. Spots are still very prominent, so I think it's a male. And the hyena is just looking up. A Texan's vehicle, he's just arrived in the sighting. So that's what he was looking at. You'll see a little blur of a vehicle in the background. It looks like he's repositioning. I'm just going to tell Tex what's going on here. Texan, just with one uh, Amnesia and then Karula's on the other side of the, the jackal there. Well, as the hyena lies in wait patiently, a Steph would like to know how long will hyena wait? And I guess just like Miss Jen's question earlier, a lot will depend on the patience of the individual. But I've seen hyena waiting at carcasses for many, many hours in the hope that they will get some food. Well, not in the hope, in the knowledge that they will usually get at least some kinds of scraps. But I guess it depends on how desperate they are and what's happening around them, Steph. I have also, in the same breath, seen a lot of hyena come and go from kills. And once they know of a kill in a given area, they may not invest constant time to it, but they'll keep stopping by as they come and go from their wanderings. I guess in scenarios where lions may have made a kill, Steph, they'll wait Again, three or four days just waiting for the lion to move off and the knowledge that there'll be some bones and little scraps left for them. But whether they decide to, again, wait permanently there or come and go to check up on the status of the predator and the kill, I guess it will just depend on a number of different variables. Hello to Mauricia in Texas and she's reminded me of an awesome sighting we had not too long ago when a pack of wild dogs was attacking a hyena. It was actually two hyena initially, one got away and then the pack of ten adult dogs began to concentrate their efforts on attacking one individual hyena. And it did seem fairly shredded up around its rump where they were doing the, the majority of the attacking and biting. But nobody has seen it, Mauricia. So nobody's seen a hyena running around with any injuries yet. So we're not too sure where it is. I'm fairly confident it would have survived that attack. It wasn't a, a very brutal attack, or at least the injuries that it sustained didn't look to be fatal. But we haven't seen it. I haven't heard any updates from any of the guides. But it'll be interesting to keep an eye out. Hold on. I thought I heard a jackal alarm calling.
It could have just been some Birchall starlings right behind us, though. Sorry, Zebs, I'm just going to stand up a little bit. Just to make sure I know what's going on back there. Jackal will alarm call at an animal like a leopard or other predators. So, no, there's no sign of it back there. So I'm thinking it was just a Birchall starling that kind of hit an off note, or maybe my hearing just played tricks on me. The alarm call of a jackal goes something like this. Wow! And uh, not too dissimilar from the call of a Birchall starling. I got really excited though because jackals will alarm call for animals like I say, possibly leopard, but also lion, any of the major predators. It looks like the hyena has spatchcocked its back legs open. That's why it looks abnormally wide at its back end. Kind of splayed its leg legs open as I'm sure a lot of your domestic dogs and cats will do from time to time. Now it is up to you guys as to what we should do. So please let me know your thoughts. We have been here now since, well basically for an hour, and nothing has changed. The hyena has been waiting here, the leopard has been sleeping behind us, and that could of course all change like it has right this second. Perfect. So we we'll don't, have, don't have to worry about sending through your thoughts as to what we should do just yet. Well, maybe start sending them through. If nothing happens here in the next few minutes, we can head off and see what else is going on. It sounds like Brent's vehicle is causing some trouble and he's not managing to send out a picture. So that's why you haven't got an update from him just yet. But he is out and about searching, which is good. news um, Brent's picture has literally just popped back up and he's found a track of a hyena that he would like to show you so quite applicable as this hyena heads off away from the kill he will give you an update on how his morning's going and also show you a track of that animal see you later welcome to safari live my name is Brent Kiersmith I have Brian Joubert on camera with me and I know you guys have been with Scott and Krula and Hyena, so I thought it'd be quite interesting to stop and have a look at some hyena tracks. Here we have the back foot of an of a adult hyena. You can see quite small, probably the length of my index finger there, and quite narrow. So hyenas don't carry a lot of weight on their back legs, and they've got that massively built front part that's designed to be able to lift incredible weights of meat and carry them away from carcasses. So with that in mind, have a look at the front track. It's a, probably double the size of the back track. And obviously the, back, the front legs far more developed, far more muscular, uh, and that helps with them being able to lift and carry those large pieces of meat and bone and that away from carcasses. This is quite fresh from last night and it actually is heading towards quarantine. So who knows, possibly this is the same hyena uh, that's with the Queen of Juma at the moment. But it is quite a cold and rainy morning. Fortunately, the drizzle's gone away. It was drizzling a little bit when we started this morning. And there's a little bit of breakup in the cloud happening. Uh, I'm hoping it continues. I really prefer the warm weather. Uh, it'd be nice to see a bit of sunshine. But we've gone out and we've looked along our western boundary this morning. There was reports of the Salala pride of lions uh, moving towards our boundary. Unfortunately, they ha there's no sign of them crossing just yet. But we will definitely be keeping a very close eye on that boundary. So uh, now we're going to head down towards the Buffalo Hook area, towards the northeast, see what's going on there. There is some fresh signs of elephant around. I haven't heard any yet. We haven't spotted any, but I'm hoping they're about. And always good to be out in the bush early in the morning. You can hear the birds calling. Uh, that very beautiful, which is a boo-boo, which is a type of shrike. And even with this cold, windy weather, there's a plethora of birds 
that are waking up and getting ready. They're quite excited, like all the insects, after the rain. Uh, lots of food for them. So we're going to slowly make our way along the edge of the drainage line here. Uh, this road is running to quite a nice area. It's quite open um, down towards the drainage line, and there's a reason for this. So the water seeps from the crests down to this area, and this really high productive duplex soils that have got sand on top of clay uh, create really good grazing. So you quite often find some of the grazing species in these areas, and where there's a lot of grazing species, there's always the potential for predators. this time of the year after the rains, uh, the termites are out in profusion, and specifically the alates. The alates is the sort of breeding version of a termite, and Donovan and is asking if we can find some termites. Well, I'm not sure what's got Karula's attention, but... She does all of a sudden seem a lot more alert than she was earlier. While we were watching that hyena, I was continuously looking back to keep an eye on her, and she was completely fast asleep. And just a few moments ago, she popped her head up and seems quite interested in something. It's in the direction of the kill that she seems to be looking. Not sure what she's heard or what she's smelt. But isn't she a magnificent animal? What's well, interesting, while we're sitting here, and as Tibbs is zooming out, to her right, there's a log. And in the front of this fallen down log, you'll see some black earth. A lot of you will remember this as our old fireside chat spot. And we've spent many, of e many an evening sat around that campfire with all of you. And quite incredible that now she is just a few meters away. Almost exactly where the camera would be set up, a little bit to her right would be the camera tripod. You can see that old marula tree, the log that we used to sit on, is falling apart. So just as well we've got a new fireside chat spot because that is termite ridden. And not going to sustain our weights for much longer. So, I did put it through to you guys a little bit earlier as to what we should do next, and we can go elsewhere, come back a little bit later, or we can stay here. It is up to you, and because Brent is out and about searching elsewhere, we could kind of have all of our bases covered, but it could be a very long wait before she does something. I'm not sure if any of you have already sent through your thoughts but let's stay a little bit longer while you do send us through your comments i'm torn i don't know what to do half of me wants to stay and be patient and that way we could be rewarded with something cool we could get to see her going up the tree the other half of me wants to go off and explore elsewhere so send through your thoughts which will help us to Ellen in Arkansas and while we sit here and hope for more action we can hypothesize with Ellen's question and Ellen's interested to know will high leopard ever drop food down to hyena who may be waiting below them in order to create some kind of a distraction or a diversion so that the leopard could then run off and it's unlikely that that would work, Ellen. If it dropped any food to the base of the tree, all that would happen is that even through default, which does happen, the hyena would simply feed on it. If there were a few hyena there, that may change things. And let's say if an impala carcass dropped to the ground, a big piece of meat, two hyena could then 
possibly get so caught up in fighting over those scraps that yes, then the leopard would have a perfect diversion, but more often than not, leopards are happy to be patient, they'll be happy to sit up in a tree with their kill, even if they are uncomfortable, because they're safe up there. There's no reason to, for them to rush and rather take their time, be a little bit uncomfortable, but make sure that they keep as much of their precious kill as possible, rather than giving it to, to hyena. So as far as I've seen, Ellen, it's not something that leopards will ever do, but it could, on a very bizarre scenario, actually have a positive effect for the leopard. Still on the topic of leopards, hyenas and trees, Reese has mentioned that surely it's safer for the leopard up in the tree compared to down on the ground here. And yes, that is true. It is certainly going to be safer up in the tree, Reese. But leopards do back themselves and they can climb up trees, even these little silver cluster leaves that are surrounding it now, which are close to it. It could scamper up there if need be. But usually hyenas will not attack leopard, especially if the leopard doesn't put up a fight. So what you'll usually find is when a hyena comes onto a scene like this, it smelt a carcass, it knows that there's something up, it's probably also smelt the leopard. It comes and has a look around, it may walk meters away from the leopard, and if it sees that the leopard doesn't have any meat, the leopard's going to know that the hyena's not going to worry it and it's going to keep looking around for the meat. That's all the hyenas here. It's not to pick a fight, it's simply to look for another meal. So with the kill up in the tree, there's no need for the hyena to want to attack the leopard. And there's a couple of reasons for that, Reese. They're very evenly matched in terms of size and therefore it would be an unwise risk or gamble for either a hyena or a leopard to get into a tussle with one another because it could go either way and they know that. Lion on the other hand, they know that they're a lot more dominant and bigger in most cases than one lone hyena and that is why in certain scenarios where competition is guaranteed in one favor, the one animal will be willing to take risks in a fight, but usually fights are very thought about and calculated operations. They don't happen as often as you'd think they do out here. to Brian in Philadelphia and good to know you're watching again. For those of you who are new to the Safari Live experience, we've actually met Brian before he came out here on Safari only about six months after discovering the Safari Live experience around November last year. Brian, good to know you're still enjoying and the Shangan, which is the local language, the Shangan word for a hyena is an MPC. So it varies throughout different parts of South Africa. You get an Mnisi, an Mpisi, and an Mnisi is Zulu, an Mpisi is Shangana, I think, if I'm not getting the two confused. And in Swahili, also a Bantu language that they use up in Kenya, it's called an Mfisi. So those give you the ideas of the, the, the similarity between the, the names of animals that are used in the Bantu language. Now there's something else that's quite strange that is unique to the safari area that has just popped into the sky and I'm going to ask Tebs to try and find it. It is somewhere up to our left in the sky flying about. I have lost visual of it but we are going to, if it continues flying around, I'm sure we will be able to spot it. Where has it gone? somewhere behind these trees. Up oh, in the gap here to the left, Tebs. Oh, no. It's disappeared again. 
And what we're looking for is the drone. Andrew is out and about nearby. And I'm sure at some stage you may be getting some aerial views of where we are. As you can see, Karula is completely unaffected by the drone for now. And you'll just try and keep it high enough away and far enough away so that the kind of buzzing noise that it makes doesn't affect her. And hold on to your seats everyone, you're about to get rocketed up into the air and you'll be looking down on us shortly. And you can get some great views from up there, lots of big marula trees, a few trees that have been pushed down is something to look out for as well. And the jackalberry trees are the darkest green coloration, which is the tree that we park next to with the kill in it to our left. You might see some very bright green leaves. Those will be mainly from the silver cluster leaf trees. And this is the famous quarantine clearings, a large open area that we don't have too many of in the Sabi Sands. These open areas are kind of rarity out here and I love the, the scenes and the beautiful scenery that you can have in these areas because it is predominantly quite a thick, well wooded area, the Sabi Sands. Sounds like a drone's coming over for one last inspection. And it's great fun playing with these new toys. Who knows what other toys we'll be adding to our mix in the coming future. But I think combining technology with an age-old experience, the safari, it's always wonderful to try and make the most of things. Now, interestingly, you'll see quite a few vehicle tracks from where everyone's been making the most of the sighting. Like I said earlier on, it's been 72 hours, actually more, since Sunday night that we've been driving in and around here. And you'll see a few other buildings in and around this area. There's the landowner's house that you may see, which is kind of attached to where the final control room is. There's also his sister's house, which is where some of us stay, called Inga's Kaya. There's a little tent where you may see a little tent where Hayden's going to be doing some work for the Nacho Big Cat Week coming up starting on the 26th of November. Now you can even see Karula who's just in front of our vehicle. We don't want to put too much pressure on her but she's having no effect so far. She's not even concerned by this buzzing noise and I guess you could just think it's a swarm of bees. Absolutely awesome. There you can see Karula still fast asleep. Anna Marie mentioned it's a big mosquito. Oh, that would be horrifying hearing a mosquito of that size coming in. It would suck you dry in seconds, Anna Marie, but I like the way you're thinking. It is very similar to uh, a swarm of bees flying over, it really is. Which is something that happens from time to time when on safari, you'll just be encompassed by a swarm of bees making its way past you. It can be quite scary, but usually they are not interested in attacking you and they're just trying to get from A to B and you may be in the middle of their flight path. So it is something that, like I say, does happen out here and a noise that will not be unfamiliar to an animal like Karula. I'm not sure if any of you have sent through your thoughts as to what we should do. I'm still needing some help on that. Let's show you how much of the kills remaining in the meantime. We've got quite a good angle here.
So as you can see, quite a lot of the carcass is still there. Not an easy angle, but she could very well be uh, into the later parts of this evening. So still good prospects to have her around. Sounds like there hasn't been too much of a response sent through from you guys, so I'm going to make the decision on my own. And we're going to head off and come back here a little bit later. But before we do, we're going to send you straight across to Brent, who is on the northeastern corner of Juma, at around Buffalswick Waterhole, searching for any signs of life out there. Get an update from him, and we'll hopefully find something for you by the time we see you next. Welcome back. And we have a look at that grey heron. Look how full his gullet is. And all his crop. That's that little pouch just below his neck. He just, as we drove up, we saw him swallowing quite a large tilapia. So a happy heron this morning. Let's see, this is like the water hole is still quite dry. Great for your herons and storks, it makes fishing a lot easier. Coming across, it's making incredibly beautiful patterns um, with the drying mud and the hard oh, gets by the hippos. Very interesting network. And then the, uh, the Egyptian geese and goslings, they've still got four going in so far. Uh, started with seven, down to four. It's tough being a baby out in the bush. Lots of things to eat you. I'm just trying to spot, I did see a little banded plover. It's now disappeared from my view. A little three banded plover, I'll keep looking for him. And uh, let's see how fast Brian's feeling this morning and uh, there's a really pretty pair of red-breasted swallows hawking over the water hole so they're catching tiny fly insects that are above the water and it's very very interesting if you different swallow species martin species and swift species they have different trophic level levels that they feed at. So out of the swallows, the red-breasted swallow feeds at one of the lowest levels. It is quite a big swallow. And then all those sort of birds that spend the majority of their time on the wing and feeding on the wing will feed at different heights as to not come into too much competition. The little three-banded plover has escaped me. I'm still keeping an eye out for the Woodlands Kingfishers. Uh, we know they've been seen around on the Juma Dam Cam. We haven't, I haven't seen one. I don't know, I don't think any of the other presenters have seen one yet either. And I haven't heard one yet. But we are keeping a sharp lookout. The other thing we are looking out for this morning is baby impala. There's been a, a few spotted to the east of us. And I saw one last night, but not on our Travis area. has decided today is the day that we're going to see an impala lamb. I hope you're right, Edward, and I hope I'm the one who finds it. There's a woolly neck stalk in the dead knob thorn. So I was out with Peter Pretorius yesterday and the National Geographic guests uh, who are staying at Gallagher Camp. So 
in that vehicle we've got Travis um, to the east and to the north of us and we did see we saw a baby impala right near the Kruger National Park boundary that was my first one of the year very exciting now I'm hoping to see my first one on Juma and we've got a woolly neck stork in the distance in that dead knob thorn I've also been listening very carefully, see if we can hear any alarm calls or leopard and lion calling, nothing so far. So I think we're going to continue our search for the baby and pilot. Oh, just hang on, there could be a goose war. There's a, a goose flying in that's not part of the... Oh, and he's carried on. The honking of the resident pair have sent him on his way or her on, on their way. And are we going to go look for another spot of water? Okay, let's go see. I'm going to move, move, make my way up towards our eastern boundary. Uh, it's a big firebag, so nice and open. And the impala generally around there, so fingers crossed we'll find a baby. these water holes are drying out and obviously there's a whole host apart from the obvious things that utilize the water like the aquatic birds and fish and frogs and there's obviously a whole host of insect species where water is very part, uh, important part uh, of their development things like mayflies and, and dragonflies and lions and fair would like to know what does this mean for things like the dragonfly larvae? Well, I'm uh, sorry about that, Lawrence and Fair. So, well, what it does mean is that the dragonflies are not as numerous as they would be. Fortunately, a lot of these aquatic insects have quite a short uh, life cycle. So they are able to reproduce very quickly. So I'm quite sure we still have quite a lot of dragonflies around. And this little bit of rain, uh, depending on the dragonfly species or, or damselfly species, they'll be able to utilize some of the pans and puddles that have filled up. So this wind, this cool wind this morning, might make it, believe it or not, quite difficult to find in Pilar. They'll probably like to be somewhere on one of these crests like we're driving up to now uh, try to hunker down from the wind and we're gonna jump across uh, to one of the signs of summer we've been talking about with Scott and hopefully we'll be back with the baby in parlor The first Woodlands Kingfisher. Now I know some of you have seen one on the Juma waterhole cam. The zoomies beat us to it. And it's probably the same one. We are parked on the Juma Dam wall. Oh, where's it gone? Where did it go? I really do want to get some closer views of it, but you would have had a few glimpses of one of the most awesome additions to our summer crew here on Safari Live. The Woodlands Kingfishers come all the way from the central parts of Africa. And it's quite a late arrival in terms of the migratory birds. Probably only four or five days ago was the first one heard in this area. And then only now have we got to find one and show it to you, even though it was just a glimpse. I think it did fly closer towards us here so hopefully we'll be able to get you a closer view of it they are incredibly pretty birds electric turquoise blue they've also got a wonderful call that i'm hoping you're going to hear shortly you got it there oh well spotted tebs tebs has spotted it i'm just going to move forward a couple of meters and then you should get another good view of it The 
is going to be a great view from here. Look at how cool that bird is. Oh, sorry, Tibbs. Just took my foot off the brakes and that's what sent you all flying. But we've leveled out the vehicle now and got a fantastic view. Bright red upper beak, dark black lower beak. That very Zorro-like eye stripe. Black mask over both eyes and that incredibly bright turquoise blue coloration on its wings. Well, we're gonna be seeing a lot of these birds. They're huge entertainers and performers out here. And often what they'll do when they're courting, and fighting over territories and nest sites is when they land in a tree, they'll hold their wings up and jump, doing full 180 so that you get to, they display their bright blue wings to a 360 degree world. So 180 degree hops, therefore showing everyone far and wide their bright blue and impressive colorations. So we'll get to show you them doing that. We'll also get to show you them letting off their chick call, which it could even call out now. They are incredibly vocal. And that's what, oh, hello. And that's what it, what helped us actually find it, we came into the area and knowing that there was one lurking about you and just sat, sat patiently waiting for it to call. And that led us closer to where it actually was perched. And it sounds like a lot more of our viewers are watching on YouTube these days and Nancy and Adrenaline Rush were urging us to come out and search for the Woodlands Kingfishers so your request has been answered and I hope you're enjoying these great views. Now despite its name being a Kingfisher, it's a little bit misleading because they or well, the woodlands kingfisher feeds almost entirely on insects and small reptiles, but oh, that was awesome. They had it closer by, there's a few thick branches in the way, but we could get some good views. I might just need to move forward or backwards ever so slightly. Hold on there, Ted. Stay on it. Look at the beautiful blue colors there and that bright red beak. So obstructed, but you still get a good idea just of how impressive it is. And this could well be a new bird for your bird lists. Because if any of you have only joined the Safari Live experience during the winter months, this would be your first sighting of the Woodlands Kingfishers. So, I'm sure a lot of you are scribbling them that name down and happy to add another bird to the list. As I was saying though, they are hunters of terrestrial animals. They are not fish or aquatic hunters, as their name may suggest. I'm just going to reposition again. I think we're going to be able to get some great views of it. through from D asking how to distinguish between male and female of the Woodlands Kingfisher and it's incredibly difficult. Oh, it's incredible. <laughs> it's incredibly just difficult if not impossible to distinguish between the two because they look identical. So just like the lilac breasted roller and many other birds, the starlings, there is no sexual dimorphism D. And usually what you'll find is that the females are actually bigger than the males in the bird kingdom. So if they were to perch next to one another, that would be one way you could possibly tell. 
We are going to keep searching for it. I saw where it flew off to. Somewhere up ahead here on the left. Oh, here it is. It's actually not on the left, it's on the right here. As we go past this empty water hole, maybe a good time to answer Deanna's question. She's interested to know where all the hippos are. And they are where there is water, Deanna. So at water holes surrounding Juma, look at this. This is actually the same tree that was perched in when the Zumi found it, I think. So it's one of its favorite spots. And the dam cam. It's not positioned too far away from where the bird is sitting now. The temperature zooms out a tiny bit. You'll be able to see the dam cam up in the tree behind it there. There we go. So that's where we get a live feed 24 hours a day. There you can see Andrew and James playing with the drone in the background. <laughs> so all happening here. too sure where the drone is but you can see Andrew's looking up into the sky he'll be doing a combination of looking at a little screen in front of him get, getting the feed as well as keeping an eye on the drone itself sadly though where that vehicle is there's no signal for the drone that's why you guys aren't getting taken on any flights they're great bobblers of their heads and what they'll do is especially when looking for prey oh a little grooming session there when it's hunting time and they do lock targets on a little insect like a grasshopper down on the ground they'll often bobble their head from side to side to help focus so keep an eye out for that to Deanna in Colorado and she would like to know how long can we expect these woodlands kingfishers to be around for before heading back to the central parts of Africa and that's a great question they probably will spend about four months here three to four months leaving around the end of February March and they'll only leave once they have attempted to or hopefully successfully raised some chicks. Not all migratory birds will breed in this area, but the woodlands kingfishers certainly will. Last year we were lucky enough to get some views of them feeding a little snake even into a cavity of a tree to their chicks. And a lot of you will know of that cavity from the winter months as there's a rock monitor that often sleeps in that hole. I'm just going to reposition the vehicle quickly. Billy, the guide from Cheetah Plains, is wanting to cross the dam wall. And the good news is, is that you'll get to get a view of him and his tortoise shell helmet. He's wearing his tortoise shell again. And as he passes by, we'll get you some views of that. It's something that you don't get to see very often. It's the first time I've ever seen one. Billy, I was just looking at a Woodlands Kingfisher on your left as you go past there. So I'm just going to stop here and that way Tibbs will hopefully be able to get you some shots of Billy with his tortoise shell without getting too much of his guests caught in the shots. Hello everyone, how are you the doing? Huh? The Ingala? Yeah. I'm not too sure Billy. I don't have any idea where anything is, but I'll okay. call you when I find them. Okay. Cheers everyone. Cheers. Have a good morning. Well, isn't that good fun? And Billy was asking me, where are the Ingalas? Where are the lion? And I sadly didn't know the answer to that question. 
I don't know Billy very well. He's new in the area. I look forward to getting to know him a little bit better. But for now, all I know is that he wears a tortoise shell on his head from time to time. What's interesting is a lot of migratory birds will come back to very similar spots every year and Chris in Australia would like to know if the Woodlands Kingfisher is the same. I actually don't know Chris but I'm going to do a little bit of research for you right now. I'm guessing that they could very well come back to the same territories. I know carmine bee eaters do, lilac breasted rollers even though they don't leave. <coughs> will be highly territorial. The Wahlberg's eagle, which are migratory birds, will come back to the very same nest, as will a lot of birds that do migrate. So I think that it's safe to assume that the Woodlands Kingfisher will, but I am just going to do a little bit of research very quickly and confirm that with you, unless any of you know the answer and can beat me to it. Send that through Well, Prince found a magnificent antelope, and we're going to stay with this Woodlands Kingfish. It looks like he's interested in a bit of hunting, but enjoy the antelope, and we'll be back with you shortly. Welcome back, and we've come across some kudu, one of the biggest antelope we get here. It's a beautiful female, and see she looks quite dark this morning. So when the weather's cold, they'll sort of erect their hair follicles. And what that does is trap a sort of a, a blanket of air next to their body, which warms up. I'm just going to move around a little bit to try to see if we can see them. There is a nice young male with this group as well. There's quite a few of them. The animals can be quite nervy in this wind. Uh, obviously, some of their senses are dull. They can't hear and smell as well. Oh, there she is. She's a, and you can see behind her, there's a few more. taking advantage of all the nice new shoots. So we've been doing quite a few of the boundaries this morning. It's always great to check who's coming in or who's going out. And speaking of that, I've just spotted a game drive vehicle on the boundary quite a long way from us, but they parked like there's a sighting there. So not only do we track the animals themselves, sometimes we track Homo sapiens. I'm just looking at my binos to try to see what they're looking at. Just from the way they parked, uh, I'm going to guess it's possibly not just a impala or a kudu. I'm just going to keep. Can you have? You got them there, bud. Um, so we're going to shoot down there, just in case there's a leopard or a lion. Um, and while we do some low flying, let's go see what Scotty's up to. Well, interesting stuff there on the boundary with Brent. And I look forward to hearing what that other vehicle is looking at. So, in my little bit of research that I've just done, I've <clears throat> established that these birds can actually return to the same nest site for up to six years, is what has been recorded, year after year. And if they arrive back, after many months away and they find another bird and using their nest, what they'll do is they'll chase it out. They're quite aggressive, the Woodlands Kingfishers, so they command a lot of respect out here. And I guess if whoever has chosen their nest is bigger than them, they may well have to surrender.
Chris Rogue has just mentioned that she loves watching these animals hunt and kill their prey. And what they'll do when they catch big insects that need to be dispatched is they'll clobber them whilst holding them in their beak against branches or rocks. And Chris Rogue says she does a lot of that viewing on the Juma Wattsall cam. So a great way to still be on safari while we are resting between drives. You can still be out and immerse yourself in this wonderful wilderness. So what will be interesting, I guess, on the topic of them returning to nest sites is whether or not they use the same nest that we knew where they were nesting last year in that monitor lizard hole. A big reason why a lot of the birds will migrate back to parts of South Africa every summer is for food. Not only good weather but good food makes for a good holiday and the Woodlands Kingfisher along with almost every single migratory bird will be getting the majority of their protein and food from the flying ants, the winged reproductive termites. That some of you may have seen the video of on my Facebook page, Scott Dyson Safaris. If not, have a look and you'll know exactly what we're talking about. And the biomass of all the termites in Africa is apparently heavier than all the mammals. Well, maybe getting that slightly wrong, or it may be the amount of food that the termites process is more than the amount of food that all the herbivores process, amounts of vegetable matter. The bottom line is there are massive, massive amounts of them. They are everywhere, under the ground, in these big termite mounds. And just because we don't get to see them, we kind of take for granted how many of them they actually are. And as these reproductive termites leave their nests in the summer months in their millions, if not hundreds of thousands, the birds will feed on them. And they're extremely high in protein. Us as humans can also feed on them. And last year, Peter Pretorius, one of the other presenters who's back in town now, was actually lucky enough to get a sequence of a young hyena, fully grown but young, walking through the quarantine clearings that we were about to pop out, literally just plucking them out the air, mouthful, mouthful, just one flying ant at a time. Obviously for an animal like a hyena it's going to need to eat quite a few of them, but still, high in protein and a very important way of how the nutrients in this area are recycled. Termites specialize in feeding in dead plant matter that is typically undigestible. No other animals can process it. So if it wasn't for these termites, they wouldn't be breaking down this dead plant matter and then getting it into a recyclable form that can be get reused in the nutrient cycle. And a lot of termites will actually go directly into the bellies of a lot of animals and that way the nutrients will be spread and sent out and dispersed back into the ecosystem. Now we are going to be making our way back to Karula just to check in on her. She may be up in the kill feeding on the remains of this impala kill. Just have a quick look what's going on there. It sounds like Brent may have heard some elephants. He's just trying to get the vehicle into a better spot. So that's good news. If, if Karula is not here or if she is still fast asleep in the same place, then hopefully Brent would have managed to find those lines. If not, what I'm thinking of doing is going and having a look back at the lilac crested roller nest. I did pop in there briefly yesterday evening and I was hoping that I was going to get a good video of the chicks which are really growing so quickly but didn't get the, the best video so I'm going to try and possibly get another one to show you guys on how their progress is coming along. So 
Karula's kill, just for those of you who may have just joined the show, is up in this dead, or not dead tree, up in this tree to our left. That we've just passed by, and then she's lying up just in front of us in exactly the same spot where we left her earlier. And wonderful that we can come have a close look at her without really disturbing her. She's completely unfazed by our presence, which is great. So we'll probably come back a little bit later and we'll do a loop around into another area of Juma and that'll take us down through an area called Philemon's Dip. Sadly Philemon is not still around, the person who the road is named after, but he was obviously quite significant here at Juma many years ago. Speaking about termites earlier, this is a termite mound on our left, a small one. And I'm just going to point out different sized and shaped ones for you as we go along. Another kind of small one to our right here. They'll be doing a great job feeding on the tree, but not only that, also a lot of little bits of grass and other dead plant matter. And now we're getting to see a very big one up ahead of us. And Jen on Twitter has just asked, how long will a termite mound be active for? And it can be many, many years, many different generations of termites could live in this termite mound, Jen. And a queen, who will be the main leader of this termite mound, one individual female who turns into an egg-laying machine. She'll be a big grub almost. She won't look very termite-like at all. And she'll be immobile in what is called the royal chamber, where she'll lay up to 30,000 eggs every single day. Those eggs will be removed from the royal chamber and be tended to by worker termites elsewhere. The same worker termites will also bring her in food and kind of pamper her in her royal chamber. Now that queen can live for up to 10 years, possibly even more than that. So she can live for a very long period of time. When she dies, it then depends on many variables, either another successor queen or reproductive, the flying ants, that's how they start before they molt into and metamorphosize into the queen bee, hopefully one day, or not the queen bee, the queen ants. So the flying ant that could leave the termite mound, which is what we see after the first summer rains, what we saw a few days ago, the winged aliots leaving the termite mound. Some of them could stay in there, one of them could become a future successor, and that way the termite mound could grow over many generations, and therefore 40, 50, 60, 70, 100 years a termite mound could carry on with different generations of queens. Now this one, I have no idea how old it is, but I mean it's a, it's a big structure. So I'm guessing it could be well into the, the 20s as a guess. But again, so many variables as to how quickly they could construct the termite mound, how successful the queen is at laying eggs, how often they get raided by other animals. Now what's interesting is that when these specific termites, which are quite large, decide to start leaving, we haven't seen any of these ones leaving yet. The ones we saw leaving were harvested termites. This is a large fungus growing termite, so you get many different types of termites. But these large fungus growing termites, what you'll notice when they are getting ready for the reproductives to leave is that, especially up on the chimney, that highest part of the mound, there'll be little kind of smiley faces, kind of horizontal slots or slits. And it's out of these horizontal slits that the winged reproductives will come emerging out of before flying off. So they've got a very distinctive kind of landing pad. Not dissimilar from the termites, the harvested termites that 
we filmed just a few days ago. They also have a kind of launch pad to send the reproductives off from, and that was a small tube coming out of the ground. The harvested termites were or are nesters subterranean, so you don't see their mounds sticking up above the ground. And they just built these tiny little tubes out of soil, and that's where the termites were ejecting themselves out of. And Ria, you're exactly right. The termite mound we're looking at now is the home of the large fungus growing termites. So what they'll do is they will feed on dead plant matter and then they'll collect their droppings which are only very partially digested. It's not easy for them to digest the cellulose and lignin in the dead plant matter. But what they will be able to do is then farm a fungus on those pellets of dung and that fungus helps to further break down their dung that they can then refeed on once it's in a more digestible form. So the fungus is doing its job on the planet. It's a decomposer. It breaks down matter. And aren't those termites clever enough to be able to farm the fungus by controlling the temperature, the moisture levels within this termite mound? And they'll do that by opening and closing the various slots. Oh, they've got a visitor, a millipede, enjoying a tour of their castle. So a hive of activity. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump out quickly. What's interesting with termite farms, in order for them to farm their fungus effectively, they need to keep the temperature constant, as I say, and not constant, but at a nice warm, kind of fairly constant temperature. And what you can feel is that often there's very hot air being emitted from the top of the chimney and the termite mound. Let's maybe go and have a closer look and let you know. just keeping a close eye on Karula there and you wouldn't believe it but she actually just got up she's heading towards the kill but the air was very hot and humid and it's something that's definitely worth trying to experience when out in safari it's not uncommon on a cold day like this to even see birds sitting at the entrance of that chimney or the exits of that chimney getting warmed up by them now there's a few vultures flying around now and a batalier and maybe that the birds have got her attention this is going to be so cool we might actually get to see her jumping up into the tree and a karula finally you've woken up sure if a battalier, which is a carrion eating bird, came and landed in the tree to try to steal some of the kill. That may have woken her up. I'm not too sure though. Now get ready to take some screenshots because at any moment she could jump up into the tree. It should be wonderful to see. Oh, she's looking up. She's thinking about it, that's for certain. Beautiful. Now I'm not sure which side she's going to jump up, that's always a tricky one. Or whether she is going to jump up at all. Oh, 
like I said, it could have been just the fact that she wanted to chase away these carrion-eating birds, the battalier, and there was a white back vulture that I saw swooping away. I don't think that is the case. Maybe they just kind of woke her up and got her thinking about the meal. But she's not convinced just yet. Just going to reposition the vehicle ever so slightly so we can get a view of the actual kill as well. Adrenaline rush and hope you're enjoying the safari. Adrenaline rush would like to know how much do I think this leopard weighs? And she hasn't been weighed or captured for research or any reason like that, so she has never been weighed officially before, which very occasionally does happen. And I've never actually seen a leopard that has been weighed. So difficult to, to be certain, but I would guess at around 40 kilograms, somewhere around 80 pounds would be her weight. Possibly slightly more than that, possibly slightly less would be the average weight of a female leopard in this area. Males ranging up to 100 kilograms, a big male adrenaline rush. So a lot will, like I said, all just vary on the individual. Angela's just mentioned that Kurila doesn't actually look that bloated considering she has been feeding on Impala since Sunday evening. And you're right, I mean, that's the benefits leopards do have over most other predators is once their kill is in a tree, they can eat with less haste than most other carnivores. You try and get their meals consumed as quickly as possible before they get stolen. I'm wondering, there's a small chance we might be able to get a glimpse of this vulture that's lurking about. That's what she's looking at. It's flying about in the background there, but it's so, so low below all these trees that it would have been impossible to see it, but at least you got a glimpse or an idea of what she was looking at. going to be worth going anywhere just yet. I think she's could well go up this tree and have a few more mouthfuls of Impala. No guarantees that. Oh, big yawn screenshots. That's also a very good sign that she is thinking of moving. So is this the grooming? Come on, Karula climb up the tree for us. Here comes another yawn, I think. I really would love her to go up the tree. I know some of you would have seen her jumping up the tree, but it's not something we get to see very often. looking promising. She's looking back though, thinking about it. But I think 
she's going to continue relaxing this morning. going to go and relax now, Karula, possibly on a termite mound behind us. She has been spending a lot of time on one set termite mound, which is about 50 meters to our west. And now that she's comfortable that the kill is safe and that the vultures and battlers have moved off, I think she's going to get back to her sleepy ways. Just keep an eye on her, try and get you some more visuals of her on the move. Sounds like Brent is having some joy with the elephants. So that's some exciting prospects for a little bit later on once she does go back to sleep, or if she does go back to sleep. Oh, a hooded vulture's just taken off above us. There it goes, got a quick glimpse of it. Great. Ha Now, the leopard's running back as quick as she can back towards the tree. How cool is this? The hooded vultures landed in the top of that tree. And that's exactly where the killers. Oh. <laughs> and the leopard's just gone up the tree. Um, we're gonna. Oh, and the vultures come out. So she would have been up in the tip top of that tree very quickly. And I'm gonna try and get back to the tree to see what she's doing. Of the vulture is done. Wasn't that incredible? Here comes the vulture flying past us again. Now I'm going to be interested to see how high up in the tree she has got. Uh, quite high. Well, we're in luck. The vulture has caused us to have a wonderful sighting. Now I wonder what her next moves are going to be. See the kill just a meter or so directly below her. Well, this is a rare kind of view of this leopard. We basically directly, not directly underneath it, but Elaine has noticed that she's very white on her belly and chest. And is that normal? It certainly is, Elaine. Their golden coat is on the kind of upper parts and more visible parts of their body. But they're very white underneath, and it's the same with lion. They've got a very white undercarriage, you could say. And that's because they don't need camouflage on their belly that's usually tucked against the ground when they are hunting. So it's not abnormal, her coloration. She's perfectly normal, normally colored leopard. She's doing very leopard-like things, not getting comfortable in this jackalberry tree. I think we can reposition to get a better view of her now that she's got comfortable.
man. Wasn't it wonderful to see that interaction earlier? Kevin, you are certainly right. She is completely aware of her surroundings and didn't miss a beat there. As soon as that vulture took off, she had her eyes locked on it. When it landed in the tree, well, that's when she started trotting over just to make sure that vulture didn't try its luck. I guess she would have been doing that because she didn't want the vulture to steal, not even a little morsel. But more importantly, she didn't want the vulture to dislodge the kill from the tree. And I'm sure that has happened on many an occasion. When the leopard's off relaxing nearby, with the kind of knowledge that its kill is safe up in the tree, from hyena, which may be lurking nearby. But if a bird comes and dislodges the kill, well then that will aid the hyena greatly in being able to run off with quite possibly a large portion of the kill. Okay, well it seems like things have calmed down now and Brent, I think, is with some elephants that he has been searching for for quite some time. So we're going to send you across there and keep an eye on Karula while you're gone. So we've come across a wonderful herd of Ellie's and I'm sure you guys might be able to hear the drone which is flying high above us. And you can see the elephants right in front of the car taking absolutely no notice of the drone or us. Very relaxed big female. I think she might be pregnant. Uh, oh, hello. Just saying hello, giving us a little shake of the head, reminding us that she's a big animal. And the reason I say she might be pregnant, if we look at her teats, they're very, very swollen. And she does, it's difficult to see when an elephant's pregnant from the belly, but the fact that her teats are very, very swollen and she doesn't have um, a youngster with her is possibly a sign that she is pregnant. You can see a bit of a bulge uh, in her belly. So maybe she's pregnant, but oh, actually I'm pretty sure she's pregnant with those enlarged teats. There, I don't know if you can see them yet, Brian. There is a tiny, tiny baby moving towards us. We've got this one here, but there is a minute baby, a couple of weeks old. I'm going to try to sneak forward a little bit so you guys can have a look. It's just in the bush next to us, but it's so small. See him there. You got good? Tiny, tiny baby there. hiding under mom's belly, as they like to do at that age while mom is feeding. Oh, it looks like they might come out into the open near us. Maybe curiosity will get the best of the little guy and come give us an inspection. So we were rushing off down the road to go see what a game drive vehicle was looking at a little bit earlier and it happened to be elephants as well. Unfortunately, they moved, when we got there, they moved further across the boundary. But lucky enough, we went on for a few hundred meters and we found these elephants well within inside Juma. There's a, another young one here, not quite as young as the, the little one behind. But I think if we're patient and wait, chap, uh, then might get a nice view of that tiny guy. And see, this one's probably, I'm going to see if the tushes are coming out. We're probably close on a, a year or so old. And see, he already mastered the art of the trunk and is supplementing mom's milk with vegetation and also possibly a bit braver moving a bit further from mom uh, amongst the herd while the little little ones will stay very very close to their mothers
Jeez. I don't know how many elephants there I have, but there are quite a lot. I can hear them all around us. So we'll try to sneak forward again a little bit and try to see where that little guy and his mom have gone. going to be able to get a view. They're going down to quite thick, thick bush. So we're going to have a look what the, you guys are seeing from our eyes in the sky. Well, you can have a look. Uh, you can see some of the eddies. You can see the little ones. You can see how green the bushes are after the rain. Uh, we're just moving and we've got a young elephant. Looks like a cow, young cow next to us here. He's still out in the open. Uh, hasn't headed into the drainage line. And welcome back. And we can see this Ellie, and she's got a nice big piece of wild asparagus in her mouth. And it looks like she's going to head off to join the rest of the Ellies. Well, not quite yet. But they are. Moving down to the drainage line is quite thick. I think they might cross out to the other road. And it sounds like there's some more Ellie's on the other side of the drainage line. So I think we're going to lose visual of them here shortly. So what we're going to do is we're going to move around quickly. Shouldn't take us too long at all. Um, to the other side of the drainage line. And hopefully they'll be far more open. And I'm really hoping we get a chance to have a, a really good look at that baby. It was tiny, probably a couple of weeks old at the most. and we're not going to have much to see while we do that. Let's go have a look at what the Queen of Juma is up to. As you can see, Karula is using her paw as a pillow and seems to be getting fairly comfortable on this spot. She's been kind of twitching her head from side to side, trying to work out what is going to be most comfortable. This is her most recent position. Well done to Brent for finally getting you into a good spot to view those elephants. There don't seem to be as many elephants around today as there have been over the last week or so, so their numbers could be dropping, coming and going. They aren't territorial like this leopard. And it's always interesting to note how their numbers do fluctuate greatly in the Salby Sand, so it's great to make the most of them when they are around because it's not always the case. Now Elaine in Michigan earlier on was chatting about the white coloration under the st stomach and we've got quite a good view of it now. I mean you can see this bottom half of her belly there's a lot lighter in coloration, a lot less gold around her rosettes. And that's even applicable right up to the tip of the tail. Even the legs which is dangled down now, the front of the legs are golden, but the back of the legs are white. And that's obviously because everything that they're stalking is only going to be, a, be seeing their front. And also the top half of their body is they're often flattened to the ground as they stalk their prey. Well, now she's just flattened to this tree. <laughs> Which is making for some very sleepy poses, and I'm getting tired just watching her. Mm. 
no, a lot of you are interested to know if I think she could be pregnant. She certainly could be, but I'm not saying that because of the, her appearance. I'm saying that from the fact that she's been doing a lot of mating over the last few weeks. I know Tasmanian Devil was one of those viewers interested to know whether she could be pregnant or whether it's simply that she is impregnated with Impala. And I think it's the latter. I think it's the impregnation of Impala that's causing her to look like she could be carrying. Predators don't show nearly as many signs of being pregnant as do the herbivores who give birth to far more developed and larger young. But with the predators it can be exceptionally difficult to tell that they are actually even pregnant. I hope she is. She's very long overdue giving birth to some new cubs, or at least that we've seen. And in the whole year that we've been here, we have been unfortunate in that we have not been able to film any little cubs. And they're incredibly cute. And I'm looking forward to not only sharing their cuteness with you, but hopefully the next leopardess to give birth to some cubs will be successful in raising them. And then we'll be able to join in in the adventure of a young leopard cub who I will tell you in advance is up against terrible odds in terms of surviving but we will get to see some incredible behavior and developments if we are lucky or if the leopard is lucky and does manage to survive. But for now we can just monitor the growth of baby birds. There's a lot of birds nests that we know of so it's mainly baby birds development that we are monitoring. No leopard cubs or even lion cubs but that could change. I know now that the Birmingham boys are beginning to rather than fight amongst other lions of this area they're beginning to fight amongst themselves for mating rights and they've been doing a lot of mating around Juma literally around us not on Juma so much but the li lioness that they have been mating with should also be giving birth in the near future so hopefully some baby cats will be out and about soon but for now we've just got the adults to deal with which is not a bad situation to deal with especially if there are animals like the leopard there's many parts of Africa where you can view lion and cheetah they're fairly easy to habituate and fairly common in wilderness areas but what is not is the leopard and they are often very shy and elusive and don't allow you to get very close to them or to view them not nearly as much as Karula over here and the other leopards of the Sabi Sands it's what makes this wilderness destination so popular amongst the many places you can go in Africa the Sabi Sands is definitely one of the best places to see animals like this the leopard speaking of baby birds whose nests we can monitor I think we're going to give you one last view of Karula before heading off into the nest cavity of a lilac breasted roller which is only about five minutes away from us I don't think she's going to be doing any feeding she's probably just going to be tossing and turning on what appears to be an uncomfortable log the only reason she came back into this tree is because of the vulture that came and landed here a little bit earlier sadly the elephants that Brent was with earlier have moved off into very thick bush and he could not relocate them for you so we're just going to send you across to him for an update on what his plans are for the rest of the morning and I'm going to continue on like I say to the nest of the lilac breasted rollers So unfortunately those elephants moved into a much thicker area uh, and we don't want to go bashing and crashing around there. And, and we are searching for the first baby impala born on Juma. So we're hitting all the likely impala spots. So far, impala, which are sort of everywhere. We've seen three and they were all males. So no ladies yet this morning. 
but uh, we are hoping that we are going to see some shortly. We're heading up towards Philemon's cut line, quite a good area for Impala, and then head up towards sort of Zoe's Road, some nice open areas there, and we've already been past Impala plans, but maybe it's worth another trip. And also up towards Sandy Patch, that area. So hitting all the likely Impala hoods. See if we can see the next generation of Juma Impalas. Impala, quickly Impala. Are oh, there babies there? I see two females. Let's slide. So this is our first female Impala. Now we're going to look very carefully for a little one. Only see two. Surely should be a few more about. Morning, madam. So, the one on the left is an adult who's likely to give birth. The one on the right is last year's baby, so probably, no, not probably, definitely not ready for a baby of her own just yet. But we can only see two, which is quite unusual. Hoping there are a few more about. Uh, female impala sometimes do move away from the rest of the herd when they're about to give birth, although I don't think this female looks like she's about ready to pop just yet. And quite often it's important to switch off and listen and try here that little contact call that the baby and pilot make. Listening for that burp, burp, almost sounds like a little burp. Best description of a baby and pilot contact call. You can see all their hairs raised, trying to form that insulative blanket around them. It's a very chilly morning, but no babies here. Let's continue our search for the first baby impala at Juma. This morning we were at the Buffalo's Hook waterhole and speaking of babies, and they had seven goslings recently and they're down to four and Steph was just wondering and while I spotted that, I spotted a pretty flower. Oh, that one. And it's a different one. It looks to be a different one to the one we saw on Arethusa a few safaris ago. It is of the same family. I'm just going to have a jump out and have a quick look. Brian's got it there. Nice big one there. And it is a crinum lily. But which crinum lily? I'm not 100% sure. So here we go. Nice big crinum. So with a candy striped crinum, which is another type we get here. I'm not sure which this one is. I'll have to double check. 
you have a pink, sort of very, very pink, almost looks like those sort of candy stick colored uh, lines that go up to the petal. But this is a, a different crinum. And there's a very beautiful flower. Most of the crinums are quite noxious, uh, so you don't want to get the sap on your skin. Beautiful, beautiful flower. And I am hoping that with this rain we will get a few more wildflowers out. They are one of my favorite things out in the bush at this time of the year. Add a splash of magnificent color uh, to the proceedings. We are going through a very dry time, although we have had a little bit of rain at the moment. Uh, Claire, who's from the Big Apple, is wondering where do we get our water from? Where is our water supply? Claire, it comes from underground water, so aquifers, uh, and we have a couple of boreholes on the property. And that is where we get our water from. And while we move along looking for more Impala and hopefully that first lamb of the season. Uh, speaking of something that's probably as as big a fan of as of baby impalas as everyone else, uh, Shadow, the female leopard. Lisa is wondering where Shadow been hiding. Lisa, I wish I could tell you. And maybe she's found a baby impala nursery and she's having a great time there, but I haven't heard any, I haven't heard of anything uh, to the west of us on Arethusa about Shadow for a while. Last I heard she was heading west. Wonderful crinum lily. And Penelope says, why doesn't anything eat them? Right? Well, Penelope, a certain insect species and stuff will, but they, as I said, they are noxious. They have quite a, quite a strong uh, poison in them. And that's why a lot of the, the bigger things don't eat them. Just having a quick look in one of my books here quickly uh, to see if I can find out which crinum that is. And fortunately, sometimes you have to go through our three or four flower books before you find the right flower. And it's one of the, in terms of all the books we have out here, it's one of the more difficult ones to get a book that covers everything uh, on the flowers. to see crinum. I'm, I'm relying on Brian's eyes to spot that baby impala while I'm checking in my book. It's multitasking. Who said men can't mild multitask? I'm driving, reading, looking. Maybe I should concentrate on two, not three. Uh, CR, CR, yes. There we go, we're in the right area. I'm not seeing a crinum here. CRI. No, the crinums aren't in this book. So it must be in my other book, which is at home. So I will try and find out which that very white crinum that's flowering at the moment is.
call, alarm calling. So we just have a quick look. Remember, squirrels being so small and they're hunted by lots of things, so it could even be a mongoose. But then again, it could be a leopard. And this is an area we do see shadow in from time to time, so maybe she's decided to grace us with her presence. Another good impala area with no impala in it. What are you shouting at, squirrel? Doesn't sound too serious though, so it's not a really exciting alarm call. question from Ravi in New York. Did you learn? The uses of elephant dung. He said a pillow for lions, a plaything for baby wild dogs, and obviously a food source and a ball for dung beetles. Uh, but elephant dung has a lot more uses than that. And if we turn this one over a little bit, we'll look inside it. Let's have a look. There we go termites, uh, specifically the, the, a lot of the, the ground dwelling termites that don't live in those big mounds, and they're very, very white and very, very sun sensitive, so they can normally only harvest wood in that after dark, but a lot of them to make use of wood during the daylight hours and get protected from the sunlight, will come up under the elephant dung, and you can see here where they've literally taken out specific bigger pieces of wood and left the sort of pulp, and they would have fed on that. So there's another use. It's a food source for termites. Uh, another really, really nice thing from a people point of view is it makes very good paper, elephant dung paper. And then actually there's something else eating the elephant dung here. Mold. So there's some mold eating the elephant dung. So there we go. Food from mold as well. And another human use apart from making paper, which is quite nice, the elephant dung paper's got a wonderful texture. Uh, another human use for elephant dung is an insect repellent. Uh, if you burn elephant dung, it's quite smoky and it keeps biting flies and, and, and the mosquitoes away, so there's another use for them. Literally, I think you could probably get to about easier 500 to 1,000 use, different uses for elephant dung from different animals. Birds will sift through it to feed off seeds. Other birds will sift through it to feed off the insects that feed off it. And there's a whole host of insects that will also feed off it. Brian, do you think of anything offhand? The rulers that they eat that come through. Yes, the and they, uh, elephant dung is used by a lot of trees uh, to disperse their seeds. And obviously the seed gets a nice sort of uh, pile of compost to start life in. And we will be, I'll keep checking. Sometimes you see those little trees coming out of the elephant dung. Uh, also very good to throw at cameramen when they're ups when you're upset with them. So lots and lots of uses of elephant dung. And let's continue our search for baby and pilot. And let's remove this while we're here. Pick that up when we're with those Ellies. is incredibly great at finding birds nests and I know he's been keeping you updated um, with the lilac breasted roller nest so off to Scotty so he can give you his bird update for the morning. So this is an old video from the 10th of November just nine days ago and you'll notice that 
These little blobs are the rollers. They've got hardly any feathers. It would be nice if you moved a little bit so that people can see what you actually are. But I don't think we're going to get that lucky. So you can see there are hardly any feathers. That's a tiny little wing there. And that's one head kind of sitting head to toe, similar to how they're sitting in the next video that I'm about to show you. So as you can see there, the date, sorry, at the top of the screen, 10th of November. Now, just nine days later, just nine days, look at how much they've developed. So you can see at least one little head there. They nestled up next to one another. The second one's head, I think, is facing the opposite direction but look at all those bright feathers and they're looking just like their parents are now and i think it'll be pretty soon before they come out and we can take a closer look at them how cool is that i mean ridiculous that in just nine days they can develop from a featherless little fledgling into a brightly colored almost adult looking bird so the parents are doing a wonderful job doing some serious hunting being able to not only feed themselves but also these two growing chicks and like I said doing a great job because they are growing incredibly incredibly quickly now I think those chicks the first time we filmed them on the 10th of November could have hatched possibly a day or two before so we're looking at around just about approaching kind of two weeks of age and it's not uncommon that around the two week period a small bird of the size of a lilac breasted roller could well fledge so anywhere from 14 days to 21 days is your kind of average fledging age so that's something to look forward to and it's just been so wonderful that we've been able to monitor their growth and development and what I'll try and do is stitch together a video of them metamorphosizing into the final product which will be quite fun and I certainly haven't been able to share the development of chicks growing like that with anyone before. And it's been great to do it with you guys. So because Jamie is going to be doing an extended drive from 8 a.m., end of the regular safari time until 9.30, so it's an extra hour and a half. Catering mainly for some schools in Johannesburg, so young kids. I'm not sure what age group she's going to be catering for exactly today, but she would love you guys to join in as well. But I need to get this vehicle back to her so she can start getting prepped for her drive. Which means it's time for me to say goodbye to all of you. And recap on what's been a wonderful morning first woodlands kingfisher on camera i'll take that boom thank you very much and we look forward to seeing more of them and also some great interaction between karula and the vultures seeing her run off back into that tree and eventually get some shots of her up in the tree it was a great way to end off the morning as well as seeing these little lilac breasted roller chicks and their developments so thanks to Nikki in the final control room and Kirsty and Louise who are lending her a hand and also of course a very big thanks to Tebs on camera and to you guys for sending through your questions and comments. We're going to send you back to Brent and enjoy the rest of the safari. A little stem book that might have confused you guys for a second. I was trying to play a trick, but the stem book wasn't wasn't playing along. I was going to say, "Oh, it's not a baby," but it, it was a little female stem booky, and they quite often don't stand still for us and disappear. And they've got an interesting name: that stem book or stem buck comes from the Afrikaans word a buckstern or a stern which is a brick because one of their defensive mechanisms against predator is to keep, predators is to keep so still as still as a brick uh, that they are undetected because a lot of the predators look for movement 
and I've actually seen wild dogs pass within half a meter, sniffing the ground right next to them, and this little skin box just sort of almost shut its eyes very tight, and hoped it wouldn't get spotted, and it didn't. So we're still on the search for the first baby impala of the summer season. Scotty got that wood Logan's kingfisher this morning. White helmet shrine. Don't fly, don't fly. You got him, Brian? Um, hopping around in that little monkey orange. Tell me forward back. Just turn. Okay. White helmet shrikes. Um, can't see what they're feeding off, but they are look to be feeding off something, or are they up to something else? There's definitely something on that little monkey orange that it was that were feeding off. If they both fly off, we'll go have a look, see if we can see if there's aphids or ants or something on that. Oh, they're such pretty birds. Could be baby spiders even there. Okay, they've moved off. Let's go have a closer look. This could be very fascinating. they haven't finished everything that's there if there was something there okay there we go there's that little monkey orange I'm just going to jump out and see if I can see anything on it I can't see anything with my eyes from here This is the little monkey orange. Hmm. I can't see anything at the moment. Sometimes it just helps to just look a little bit closer for a few more seconds. I see if maybe there was some spider web. Oh, well, I think that's just going to remain one of nature's mysteries. What were they up to? Definitely looked like they were feeding on something, but I can't see anything uh, around that. Let me just check some of the other monkey on here. There's a little bit of spider web in this one, but no, no spiders as such. Check around, see if there's anything. I thought maybe there might be some ants uh, or, and with aphids on there, but nothing. Fascinating. Uh, that's the wonderful thing about the bush. You never know what you're going to see, and you definitely don't always know the answer, which is what makes it so rewarding to be out there day in and day out. and grasses and Anna-Marie's wondering if we have any Venus flytrap plants. Uh, Anna-Marie, not, not that I know of, not in the traditional sense of a Venus flytrap. Uh, certain lilies um, and carrion flowers, which are uh, succulent, will have a very sweet sort of watery substance at the, at the base uh, that uh, insects will fall into it, very viscous, so they get stuck in it. And they do take nutrients from that in the same way, but not like a Venus flytrap that will actually close around um, the insect that has that uh, landed there. And 
there's a really interesting uh, sp spider species, I think, if I remember correctly, from South America, um, on certain carrion flowers and that, that have that sort of viscous uh, fluid at the bottom of the, of the flower that traps insect, called a diving spider. Uh, and this spider literally takes scuba gear with it. So what happens is it attaches its thread right to the top of the flower and it lowers itself into this viscous liquid. But as it does it, it sort of collects air bubbles around its mouth parts so it can breathe. And it'll go right down deep into this flower and steal the insects. And it's amazing how that is evolution's evolved that really, really unique and special skill to a spider and a flower that are both competing for insects. Black belly debusted. So hoping it's going to do its nice little call. It looks like more worried about preening and getting good looking for the ladies than attracting them just yet. And they've got that wonderful call and sort of which is almost like sounds like a champagne cork popping. And the scratching away, cleaning his chest, and you can see that really, really dark jet black that is where he gets his name from. Oh, there we go. We can't hear it from here because of the wind. I'm going to try sneak a little bit closer. You can see him when he closed the mouth there. That was. Um, to create that champagne pop. Uh, from where we are with the wind, we just didn't didn't catch the, the audio. So I'm going to try edge a little bit closer onto this clearing, and hopefully uh, he's in a displaying mood. It's incredible how dark that black is. Didn't do the click, but did a little call there. Oh, breakfast time first. Got to be well fed and looking good if you got it attract the ladies. See those beautiful colorations around the head, little white and black. Is that still pecking away at Whatever insects might you might find in this grassland. Looks like he's more concerned with finding breakfast at the moment than finding a mate. Disappearing behind the little weeping wattle. Should pop out again in a few steps. There we go. Absolutely stunning bird. Well, our search for baby impala has found us some interesting birds so far. And so, probably a couple of reasons why he's chosen this particular area 
to hang about in. Nice. He's stretching at the moment. Put his tail feathers up there. Maybe he's seen a lady and he's trying to get impressive. He's jogging towards something. Or it could be another male and he's trying to look impressive to chase it away. Either way, this is a very well-groomed black-bellied bastard. I've seen a female black-bellied bastard. Um, Brian, if you come through here, um, just above this very small, you see a, there's a female black-bellied bastard in the distance. That's what he's seen. You got her. She's quite far off. I'm gonna... Oh, look at him. Okay, let me try and move. Sorry, we can see the female bastard. Um, try, stay, I'm going to try to stay quite far away so we don't disturb uh, this gentleman's wooing. See her. You got her there, Brian. So she's just on the edge of the woodland. And you, you notice she is very similar looking, but you don't see that really striking. Um, head markings and the black does not extend as high up the throat <laughs> okay um, he's just off to the right of her trying to act all nonchalant but his tail's up he's still just move forward so she's coming right towards him to try get both of them in the same spot you got Brian, you got him now? She's approaching him. Okay, she's just behind him. And you can see he's acting nonchalant. I'm just here eating my breakfast, lady. I'm not really trying to impress you, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna extend all my feathers to look as impressive as possible. Also notice the difference between the male, you see that very white striking marking on his shoulder. I'm just gonna try and move forward slightly so you can possibly see both of them. How's that, Brian? His tail's all extended. He's trying to be very suave. I think he gave the game away when he rushed forward like an eager teenager at a at a high school dance. So we see two sort of busted or Koran species here frequently. And it's the red crested Koran and the black bellied busted. And Vancy, who's in sunny Southern California, uh, is wondering what is the difference between the two? Well, Vancy, I, as far as I can work out, it's size. Korans are small bustards, and the black bellied bustard is the smallest of the birds that actually goes by busted. So, there we go. That's, that's the only difference, a uh, discernible difference, is the size. The bustards are bigger, and the Korans are smaller. Well, it looks like he's popped his tail down. She's moving away, and 
he sort of failed in his wooing. Uh, it can go on for a really, really long time. So it's not a quick date. Uh, it'll it'll carry on and on sometimes for up to days for him to prove himself pretty enough uh, vocal enough uh, to impress her and let's just sneak down to this other little road um, and I check this area for baby impala again but there's not an impala inside it's amazing they're normally everywhere but now on the first morning we seriously look for them we've seen five three males and two females so also i'm feeling that i should definitely pay the queen a visit pay my respects before the end of drive see if anything's happening around there and just remember guys that Jamie will be taking a school drive after this as well, so it will still be on, on air. Jamie's drive will be broadcast and it will be starting straight after uh, we say our goodbyes. So nice for everyone, a bit of a bonus. Extra safari time. Just remember guys that that's, uh, that specific time is for the kids. So the kids' questions are going to take um, precedence uh, and we will be focusing on the kids uh, kids questions so some of them might seem a little bit childish and that's because they're from a child Shrines. and adrenaline rush I say I've never ever seen a bird like that on the drives uh, it looked like a cross between a parrot and a, well, and a shrike and lots of other different birds uh, also I think it's just because it's cold morning they also would be puffed up like the other animals and they are incredibly beautiful birds and they're often nicknamed the seven sisters and they move in flocks of seven Sometimes eight, sometimes five, sometimes twelve, but it's quite it's quite uncanny that a lot of the flocks will be seven individuals. And they are a type of shrike, so they are mostly insectivorous. They eat lots of little uh, insects and bugs and spiders and things like that. subject of the white helmet shrike, uh, Janet noticed that incredible yellow eye ring that's around their, their eyes. She said it looks like really intense yellow mascara and she's wondering what it is composed of. It is skin, it's, it's bare skin, so the skin in that area is colored yellow. Uh, so it's not feathers, it is, it is actually the, the skin. So before we pop in to the queen for the last few moments of drive. I think I'm going to take one last gamble with finding a baby impala and we're going to head down towards the Juma Dam and see if the hippo's around as well.
on the subject of impalas that we are searching desperately for at the moment, Marco, who's in New Jersey, is saying, how long can an impala live for? Of course, if it doesn't become someone's dinner. So, Marco, I'm not 100% sure, but if I remember correctly, it's probably around six or seven years. I have, I have in my life sea parlor. So it got so old, it started, she started going gray in the face. Uh, and that was on an island in Lake Kariba where there were no predators. I think she might have broken the records for impala, but we didn't know exactly how old she was. But out here in the bush, it's very seldom that animals get to that sort of age where they start graying around the face. Uh, and that's due to the fact that there is, there are so many predators out there. So, this is normally a great area for impala down here as well. They're all bunkered down, hiding from the cold wind on the crests. So here we go, and these impala unfortunately are not going to be producing any babies for us. Uh, the male impala with those very beautiful horns. Ex Aranga is wondering, are there any bets between the presenters who's going to see the first one? Well, not yet, but I think after this morning there might just be. And Lisa's just really excited to see more birdlings, and hopefully we will manage to catch an impala Impala birth this year. Some of that incredible battle scarring Peter's picked up in his life fighting with other hippos. And we can see the oxpeck is actually keeping the wounds open. And they will feed on congealed blood or blood as well as uh, ticks and other parasites. And if you think about it, uh, when they, they eat a tick, a tick is basically full of the blood of whatever animal it's been eating. And sometimes ox peckers can be quite a pain for different animals when they do ke actively keep these wounds open to feed off the blood. But Pete and his thick skin doesn't seem to mind too much. So we might bump into Jamie who's getting ready to start her school drives. She's at Krula now. So let's go have a look up on the top of quarantine. So it has been a very chilly morning and our search for the first Impala land of the season is by no means over. I shall be continuing it on the sunset safari. seems that Donna has, after watching those oxpeckers, said it seems like the oxpeckers are vampires. Well, they do enjoy a bit of fresh, uh, fresh blood from time to time. I don't think they have a particular preference between hemoglobin and white blood cells. wondering do any other birds oh there's a vulture a couple of vultures flying around Anna Marie I'll get to your question in a second 
Um, I think if the vultures head towards the tree where the kill is, uh, Karula might still be in the tree. Definitely try to keep them at bay. And there's a Jamie. And I cannot see who's under all the layers behind her. Uh, but he looks like he's a... Who is that? Andrew. It is Andrew. And Karula has found a nice comfortable spot high in the branches. I don't think she's moved much since you were with Scotty. And she's fast asleep, defending the remnants of her kill from the vultures. And really quickly, before we run out of time and head across to Jamie, uh, Anna-Marie was wondering if there are any other birds apart from oxpeckers that do that similar service of uh, removing uh, ticks from the animals out here. Uh, Anna-Marie, I can't think of, there's just the two species of oxpeckers. There is a bird that occurs further up in Africa called a uh, spur-winged lapwing, uh, and they're known to feed out of crocodiles' mouths, removing irritating pieces of flesh and whatnot that are caught in the crocodiles' mouths. Uh, and that's the only one I can think of is sort of similar, not quite the same. And the queen is resting upon her throne. So I saw two species of vultures, uh, there was a hooded vulture and a white-backed vulture. And what we'll probably find is that the hooded vulture found it first and then the white back saw the hooded and came in to inspect. And it's, it always looks amazing that a leopard can sleep on a branch like that and look so comfortable. Uh, it's never quite as straight or as smooth as you would want it. I don't think I'd be able to sleep in that position. So it does, it is warming up a little bit. Hopefully we do have a bit of clear skies for the sunset safari. And hopefully uh, the Sunset Safari will be able to find that very difficult animal we've been searching for all morning, and the first impala lamb of the season. And hopefully you're going to be able to find them. Uh, and it's going to be quite exciting if we do. Uh, so fingers crossed, everyone. And I just heard now that there's some lions have been found in Buffalo's Hook. That's a bit far from our boundary. But so hopefully during the night and for tomorrow's sunrise safari, they do manage to move their way east. And it's always great to have Krula on standby right here on quarantine. And from myself and Brian, we hope to see you on the sunset safari. But for the last few seconds, let's have a look at the Queen of Juma, Karula.